entrepreneur is an exciting adventure, but it is never without risk. The global pandemic has overturned the best of business plans, causing chaos and uncertainty. Still, entrepreneurs continue to follow their dreams and creatively respond to challenges, even in the toughest times. Welcome to Entrepreneurs in Residence. My name is Risha Mandelhorn, and I will be your host for this evening's event. I am delighted to introduce a stellar panel of entrepreneurs who will share their backstories, the ups and downs, and speak to working without a safety net during these turbulent times. Each will present in a short TEDx style format, and then we'll open up the Q&A for discussion. And heads up everyone, this event is being recorded as part of Aurora Public Library's archives of our, our entrepreneurs and residents. We'd like to make this ex experience as, interact as interactive as possible. So if you could just put your last name in the Q&A, Lucy Frechette, who's working tech this evening, will unmute your mic and camera if you permit, and you can ask your question directly to the panelists or share your experiences. However, if you prefer, you could just type your question in the Q&A and we'll pose this question to the panel on your behalf. Our first entrepreneur this evening is Tracy Smith founder of Kitchen Table CEO. A freelance writer by trade, Tracy was looking to balance her professional and personal life. What's her story? Welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we're jumping right in here. Uh, let me just share my slide really quickly here. Please work tech. Okay. All right. Antonella, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen okay? Okay, awesome. So hi, I'm Tracy Smith. And uh, thank you so much everybody for joining us tonight and to the Aurora Public Library for putting this event on. Us entrepreneurs and business owners have to stick together. So this is really great. So a little bit about my entrepreneurial journey. I'm the founder of Kitchen Table CEOs, a one-stop online website, women entrepreneurs building businesses from home. Um, not unique this year, but I did start this prior to COVID, so um, that it was unique back then working from home. Um, and Kitchen Table CEOs is a spot where these women can get resources, support, and on all the stuff they need to launch and grow their businesses. And a few things to help them with life at home too. My goal is to make these women entrepreneurs and small business owners lives easier. Um, content and marketing are my specialty, and I love helping small businesses to tell their stories and promote themselves so that they can reach the customers that they so deserve. And I do this through the website, through one-on-one -on -one work, through articles, uh, free resources, and my course, Content Unleashed. But enough about me. Um, instead of talking all about me and my journey, I wanna share with you four brief thoughts or mottos or lessons that resonate with me and my life as an entrepreneur that I have learned. So we'll get started with that. Hope this works. Oops. Can you guys see that square in the middle of my um, screen right now? Do you see? Is it obstructed? Antonella, can you put a thumbs up if it's just the screen by itself? Okay, cool. Sorry, I have a box over top of my slide. So we'll just ignore that. We're all good to go. Um, <laughs> okay, so the first one is your career is not a point in time or a single title, or at least this is what I believe, but rather a continuum of many destinations, positions, ups and downs, and this year for sure, twists and turns. If we think about what we want to be when we grow up, that limits us to one title or position. And for me, that's not real life. That would mean we are not growing, we're not moving, and we're not adjusting. And it would mean I have to enjoy doing the same thing for 40 years, which I think we've all come to realize is not realistic. If you think of your career and your entrepreneurial journey as a road, it's okay when you're not quite there yet. It's okay if something changes or an obstacle pops up or a worldwide pandemic happens because, well, the pandemic's not to be expected, but bumps in the road are to be expected. I think a lot of people look into owning their own businesses in their 40s and 50s because the road has been long enough at that stage to have skills and expertise or passions and experience 
that equip them for doing it on their own or trying it their own way. So your career is a journey and a topsy-turvy one at that. That is real life and it's totally okay. My second mantra that I share with all of my students and my clients is screw perfect. And this is so true for us entrepreneurs. Go ahead and kiss the perfect goodbye. Instead, I always say aim for 85% and when you hit that threshold, go for it. If you wait until you're 100% confident in your business idea, until the website is perfect, the logo is beyond your expectation, or you have everything figured out, you have every system in place, then guess what? It'll either be too late or you'll be stuck forever because perfection, to me anyway, is an illusion. Even if you do feel something is perfect, Remember that journey we talked about in the last slide, the ups and downs, the curves, the turns, the pandemics? What defines perfect changes from moment to moment and year to year? So you'll get a heck of a lot more done as an entrepreneur and a small business owner if you aim for that 85% marker and then move forward. Hit publish, press send, tell people, commit, go for it. It's not an excuse to settle for less than your best, but permission to get on with it and circle back and tweak if you need to later. Screw perfect. <laughs> permission from me. So this saying that my friend Brenda told me many moons ago, woman to woman, and it's you can be anything and everything you want. It's not at the exact same time. And I think this quote can apply to everyone, but especially young parents and moms and dads and entrepreneurs who are trying to be everything every second of the day. You want to be involved with your kids. You don't want to work late. You feel bad you're not volunteering more. Your friend just got a promotion is making more money than you. You really want to finish your basement. You should be a better cook. This list is long and the pressure we put on ourselves is huge. We can't be everything at every stage, but we can't look back and redo things. So set your priorities. Think about your life in five-year chunks. What's important right now that you can't get back? Is your mom ill and you want to spend more time with her, but that means you can't advance at work the way you want? I pick mom and cut yourself some slack. Do you love the business you're growing, but wish you could volunteer more or do something else? There's time for that. Maybe you can donate through your business, but maybe that's a next decade sort of thing. I decided to stay at home with my kids for 10 years and I stepped away from the nine to five in a huge way. And I don't regret that for a moment. Now, I was fortunate that I could do that. I know, but we planned, we budgeted, we made that happen too. Was it hard? Did I question whether it was a dumb career move at times, but no regrets. So be easy on yourself and know that there is a time and place for everything and life is long. Another entrepreneurial trick is Here's a goodie. When in doubt, Google it. Technology has come so far in the last decade. 10 years ago, I don't think I would have been able to run my business the way I do now on my own. There's an app and a tool for everything to help you on your entrepreneurial juggle. You just have to ask or Google it. So when you're trying to wear all those hats and you run into a roadblock or that road that we talked about becomes a little too curvy, just Google it or ask someone, or better yet, when you're ready, hire somebody. There is a solution out there waiting for you, I promise. So that wraps up, that wraps up my pointers that I wanted to share. I wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm honored to be with all the other panelists and I'm looking forward to hearing their story. And if one ounce of my 85% that I've given you tonight, you can relate to or helps you or motivates you or lets you know you're not alone. I'm so glad. So go for it. You can do it. And thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so very much, Tracy. It was great to, to hear from you. Um, so I don't think I've ever been as thrilled as I am to introduce Taylor Lindsay Noel, owner of Cup of Tea. So I was driving home from Toronto one night and I heard Taylor interviewed on CBC and I knew I had to bring her up and we were having an entrepreneurs in residence coming up. But I was so excited when she said that she would, she would come and present this evening. What's her story? Welcome Taylor and tell us. Well, it's gonna be hard to follow Tracy. Um, one of the things she said, I'm going to touch on the Google thing is very, very important. So I'm definitely going to go circle back to that. 
Um, but a little bit about my entrepreneurial journey is that it was not typical, but I don't necessarily know if there is a typical entrepreneurial journey anymore these days. Um, when I was 14 years old, I was a Canadian national gymnast. So I used to travel and compete for Canada and was a bright hopeful for the 20, uh, 2012 Olympics back then. And unfortunately, one day I went to a regular day of training and my coach asked me to do something that's never been done before in the world. Didn't tell me that, gaslit me the whole way. And I decided to trust him at 14 years old and unfortunately landed head first and broke my neck and instantly became paralyzed from the chest down. So my whole story in life has always been filled with pivots and changes. At that moment, my dream of becoming an Olympian changed. My dream of becoming a sports doctor pivoted. And so going through high school and going through university, I went for radio and television arts, I started a podcast. And when I started my podcast, I wanted to create my own way in media. And I knew I needed to get a sponsor. So I would always drink tea and interview my guests, hoping that David's Tea one day would sponsor me. I reached out multiple, multiple times and they never did. So instead of feeling sad for myself, I decided to again pivot. And I said, you know what, let me Google how to create a tea. Cause I'm like, if they won't sponsor me, I'm gonna create my own tea and market it back to my audience. And I Googled my way through finding how to do so. And in that process, I decided if I'm gonna make one tea, I'm gonna make five. And if I'm gonna make five, I should have a company name. And that is how I fell into entrepreneurial, my entrepreneurial journey. And that's where Cup of Tea derived from. I launched Cup of Tea on November 26, 2018, having no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to do taxes. I didn't know what was the right thing to do, if I should be online, if I should be in store. But I knew that I wanted to bring quality products, quality organic teas to the market with beautiful packaging that you could have and leave in your home and on your table. So if someone just randomly showed up at your home, you weren't shoving it back into your closet. It would be something to be proud to keep out because I knew what I liked as a millennial when I had my online shopping experiences. And I wanted to be able to bring that experience to an industry where tea isn't sexy. It's not a fun thing to do, but I wanted to bring the joys that I had and the memories and experiences I feel while drinking tea to the market. In doing so, the first year went okay, you know, just testing the market. People, anybody who had it really loved it. But the awareness was such a hard thing when you have the Tetley's, the Lipton's, the David's Teas of the world. But I decided to stay focused and stay in my own lane because when you sometimes get distracted by everything that's going on around you, it can be very, very um, disheartening. But I kept my head down, focused on my vision, and then 2019 turned into 2020. And at the top of 2020, I was not doing super well in my business. We, as most entrepreneurs do, weren't turning a profit. And I was just kind of feeling that burnout coming. I even expressed to my mom that I thought I should stop. But she's like, you know what, hold out for a few more months. And if things aren't still going well, then you can walk away. So I listened to her. And then the pandemic hit. And I was like, oh, like, what are we going to do now? But when the pandemic hit, um, we actually started to see the trend of people wanting to have their creature comforts brought to their home. And that's where we were able to thrive. In that process, a few months turned around. And then by July, I woke up to a random email that said, hey, Taylor, this is an editor from Oprah Magazine and we would love the opportunity to try one of everything to possibly feature you in our favorite things edition, which was a whoa moment. That turned into weeks and months of testing and eventually us making the list. Obviously making a list like this was life-changing for the trajectory of the business. And since um, we've been really blessed to be able to ride this incredible ride um, through a very difficult time and year for so many, um, but yeah, it's been a very weird journey to get to where we are, but I'm proud to say that we're in 
Bay and we launched on Indigo today. And um, the future of the business is really bright and I'm excited for some of the things that are unfolding. Um, and to be able to just share that, you know, everybody's journey looks different, but if you have and stay focused on the journey and vision you have and set out for yourself at the con like the conception of the brand, then there is a space for you and people will gravitate towards that. So I'll leave it there. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing and like allowing me to share my story and for the time today. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, Antonella Selena is the creative director and CEO of the Artsy Baker. Her passion for cake design grew when she was a stay-at-home mom to her two boys. And in fact, Antonella estimates that she gifted over 100 cakes before someone phoned and asked her what she charged. What's her story? Welcome, Antonella. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, can everyone hear? Yeah. Um, so my name is Antonella, and um, I uh, just grew up in a European family and um, thought it was really cool when all my friends had birthday cakes. And um, unfortunately, um, my parents believed that birthdays we um, were for, you know, their families to come over and um, it wasn't like a kid's party. And if I needed a kid's party, I went to school and I saw my friends there. So I, hence, I never really got a birthday cake. Um, and every year I just remembered uh, just wanting a birthday cake and a dog. And, um, and I swore every year that um, when I had my own kids, I would make sure that I got them a cake um, and any cake they wanted. So that was just always on my mind. Um, but I've always started, I've always worked. Um, I worked uh, from a really young age. I worked with my father selling furniture. He'd pick me up at 10 years old, put me in a beat up Tony Danza van and tell me to sell, sell mattresses. And that's what I did. And I just listened um, and I enjoyed it. And I think what really moved me uh, was the fact that, you know, just watching my father, um, how he connected with people. And it wasn't so much what he sold. It was the connection that he made with people. And for me, that was, it was so intense and I can't even explain it. And I remember that I've always, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't strive for it. I just thought this is who I am and this is what I'm going to do. And um, I just wanted to go big and I just wanted to conquer the world. And I just wanted to make every single kid happy with cake. So uh, moving along, um, I was working and I had my own children. And just before I had my children, I had a furniture company that I stopped. Uh, working uh, because I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and I just realized that I although I love my family stay-at-home mom was great but I just wanted more and I felt so selfish admitting that all the time um, so I always had to do something and um, so I just started making cakes and um, I made cakes hundreds of cakes um, for quite some time and I remember uh, my husband coming home distinctively one day and saying, hey, you better start charging for these cakes because all the money I'm making at my job is kind of going to all this product. And I thought, well, how much do you charge for a cake? I don't know. I thought this was fun. Anyhow, so um, I was making cakes for friends and family for quite some time until uh, I got a call one day from someone who asked me a price for a cake and I put her on mute and I went, oh, craps, <laughs> what do I do? Um, so anyways, fast forwarding, um, I started doing that and I did that from home. And for me, it was priceless because it allowed me to be the mom that I wanted to be, but it also allowed me to get that fulfillment from actually like self-fulfillment from like an accomplishment of actually doing something, giving back. And the best part was not only was I making my kids happy being a stay-at-home mom, I was making other people's kids happy. And that was like the coolest thing that I could have ever done. And um, that alone was so fulfilling. So never really thought it was gonna be a business. And um, in 2011, um, I got quite busy making cakes that we renovated our basement and uh, I started making my own fondant. And from there, um, I wanted to sell this product. And I didn't know how. So I would be a mom during the day. My kids would go to sleep and I would call every grocery store in Ontario, dial in the extension and say, hey, you've got to try my product. And God, I would do that. And for so long until uh, Metro uh, decided that they would bring me in for a little interview. So I brought my little batch of fondant and a little roller and um, 
he asked me how much I could supply. And I said, oh, whatever you want. <laughs> well, I'm working from a little mixer and he wanted me to supply all the stores in Ontario. I didn't quite understand it back then. Um, but we ended up opening up uh, a fondant company, which was great. My kids started JK and I just went off and I tried opening up just a little bakery. Uh, so from Creative Cakes, um, we ended up uh, having a large facility um, manufacturing fondant for for all different grocery stores. So I'm happy to say we were the first uh, in Canada to have fondant throughout grocery stores, which was really, really exciting. But more uh, exciting, uh, more than being exciting, it was just a lot of work. It was a lot of pressure. And you know what sounded, what people perceived to be such a glamorous life of being able to supply all these grocery stores and all these chains, I thought to myself, this sucks. <laughs> like this really sucks. Like it's day and night. Um, I appreciated the fact that I was there, but the amount of effort, the amount of work that it took, I enjoyed. Um, but I just felt like I was giving, I was giving to everybody. I was giving to work, my family. And I think I kind of forgot about me. And um, so I did that for quite some time and try to bistro and open up a second location. It was great um, until I turned 40 and I realized, you know, something's got to give here because I'm trying to stretch myself too thin. And I didn't want to do so much because I wanted to conquer the world and I wanted to do it all. Um, and my focus wasn't there. So I kind of brought it right back to what is it that I like? What is it that I want to do? And I went back to the fact that I just absolutely love making kids happy. And I just remembered what it felt like for me as a child, um, just to bring a happiness to a kid's face. And I thought, you know, I'm normally in people's memories, you know, for the last 15 years, I have been in these kids photos. And you know, now they're they have their own kids, and we're making cakes for them. So it just feels so great to be part of a celebration. Uh, but through this journey, um, my main goal was really to be a mom. And it was really, really difficult, because I wanted to be everything to everyone. I wanted to be a great mom and a great entrepreneur, but I just kept getting responses like, you can't do everything. You know, you just can't do it. It's impossible. First off, you're a female, you're a mom. You know, you have to pick one or the other. You're either a mom or an entrepreneur. And I thought, no, I'm not going to have this. I'm just going to continue doing what I've got to do. Um, and that's what I did. And, you know, it's funny because I really... Although there were those days, and I'm sure a lot of us entrepreneurs get them, you just want to stop. You just want to cave in. You want to just let everything stop and start again. And, you know, something about us entrepreneurs, just, you know, we have this strength about us. And um, I realized that I had a focus and my focus was on me being happy. And what truly made me happy was making other people happy. So somewhat of a people pleaser. Um, so fast forwarding, we now have um, a bakery. We make custom cakes. We make custom cakes for all different occasions. Um, but beyond that, I think the most important thing as an entrepreneur is really doing what satisfies our soul. Uh, a lot of people have said, you know, do it for money. And hey, if that works for you, that's great. Um, you know, do it because your parents gave you a business or something, whatever, you know, people do it for different reasons. But I feel, I feel so honored to be able to do something I absolutely love every single day I can wake up and literally just be a kid and play with Play-Doh and make people happy and socialize since I've always been like a social butterfly. Um, and the best part of this whole entrepreneurship was the people that I meet. Um, the people that are meet are just that I meet are just fascinating. I have learned so much from every single person, and that is by by far my favorite part of the job. Um, it was interesting though when COVID hit. I didn't know what to do, and I felt myself. I found myself kind of like at a railroad, and I thought, okay, what am I going to do here? Am I going to close shop? Um, all this this dream that you know I've worked so hard for is it just going to kind of go down the tubes? And at that moment, I think I realized my strength. And the best part of that is, you know, um, my kids were there throughout the whole journey. And without my kids, I probably still wouldn't have my business. So um, it was so fascinating to see that all these years that I focused on my kids, um, it kind of came full circle where I thought, wow, I actually think I did a pretty good job. Um, and they were my backbone through all of this. And um, a year later, we're still going through COVID. 
there's obviously a lot of struggles. Entrepreneurship is probably is not the easiest thing and it's not for everybody and it's important for everybody to know that. Um, but for me, I just love waking up in the morning and not knowing what to expect. I love, um, I love anything but a routine. Um, don't know who I'm going to be speaking to. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. And that for me is fascinating. And I know for me, um, I put it in my head, like the only option for me is success. And um, success for me is basically just being um, a great mom and being able to live a happy life. Um, and that's what I consider success. So um, I think I'm kind of getting there. Thank you, Antonella. So Eddie and Felix Ray opened Goblets and Goblins one week before COVID-19 sent the community into lockdown. Gentlemen, your timing is something else. Um, while this definitely wasn't part of their business plan, they've adapted and survived during the most difficult environment of all time. What's their story? Welcome, Eddie and Felix. Hey guys, how are you? Hi there. Um, my name is Eddie, this is Felix. Um, thank you so much for having us on this panel. We're so excited to share our story. Um, and thank you all for tuning in as well. Uh, so I guess I'll start with me and then Felix will take over because uh, we kind of have different journeys and kind of brought them both together. Um, all my life, I've always wanted to be one thing or another. One time I wanted to be an artist and then a graphic designer and I was just all over the place. So then I decided, you know what? I'll just kind of let it come to me. And then I ended up getting all these jobs at like corporations. And then I just started, you know, trying to climb the corporate ladder. And I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I, I hated working for someone. Um, I didn't like, you know, how certain businesses run. I was like, I wouldn't do that. I'd rather do it this way and that way. And just nitpicked at everything. And I'm like, and then they wouldn't be receptive to feedback. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to start my own thing. And I partnered up with my brother with it. And it's just, we took, we both took something we we're both passionate about, which is the community and games and put them both together. So it's somewhere for, you know, when you go out on a Friday or on a weekend and you got the movie theaters, you got the bars and baby bowling. We wanted a place that somewhere that people can go where they felt more included, a little safer, uh, somewhere they can bring their friends and just play their favorite board games, have a drink, have a milkshake, and uh, yeah, just hang out. And um, we got quite the community going here, and everyone is, we've gotten so many people to meet people that they would never have met in their entire lives, where it's like, hey, I play that game too, and then they would just connect through that. So that's been uh, really special for us, and just, we've become best friends with the people around us and they're not really even customers anymore. Uh, COVID has definitely <laughs> been something for us because we don't really know our business model outside of COVID. Um, opening a business that relies on social gatherings and then just having it close a week later is um, definitely, we were pretty sad about it. We I, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little sulky at first. I, did, I didn't know, like, what do I, you know, I had this, I had a plan. I'm a guy, I have my plan and I want to follow my plan. And that's, and when, when things go sideways, I, I get a little lost and confused. And then, so a week later, I'm like, okay, no, we got to do this. So we started, um, I, I started to do some research. I'm like, what doesn't Newmarket have? And they don't have a place to get a decent milkshake. So I decided to, uh, with my brother, to make some creative milkshake ideas. I'm like, we weren't going to do anything in advertising. We're going to let people advertise for us. So we made these ridiculous looking milkshakes with bacon on top and caramel. And we had other ones that we had like a unicorn one that had like a horn and everything. And I'm like, if you don't want to Instagram that, there's a different problem here, right? <laughs> so we did, every, everyone did our own advertising. And then eventually we had like, we had to put like little cues outside because we had a lineup of people get, trying to get these milkshakes. And so we turned from a board game cafe to, a, to like a milkshake parlor. And they really carried us through the summer. And I, I, was, I, I was so happy. I'm just like, I can't even believe because I, I was ready. We we're ready to close our doors. I'm like, we have, how are we supposed to do our business if people aren't coming in? So eventually um, people 
lockdown started getting a little less tight and people were able to come in and experience the store and play games with their friends. And then that's how we started building our community. And then um, after that, we obviously went to another lockdown in uh, December, the last one. And then we're like, okay, well, it's freezing. No one's going to want milkshakes. <laughs> so we started doing um, hand and homemade pierogies. Uh, we're both Ukrainian, so our mom's got a killer recipe. And so she, she's just been happy that people have been enjoying them. Uh, we, we also made them very Instagrammable. So it's a um, traditional recipe, but we decided to modernize them. So we have like pierogi nachos or like a pierogi poutine you can get. And so they're fun and people take pictures of them, post them all the time. And, um, but still they were doing well, but we were still kind of worried. Like, when are we not getting out of this lockdown? So originally we never even planned to have an online store. Our website was very, this is who we are. This is what we do book an appointment or, you know, get, get a table. And we had to, I had to basically learn code in like a week to like launch an actual website with an online store and you play games through our website and you can make an account and you can buy tickets on there. And it's just like, in your, and just to touch up on you guys, like, yeah, I Google it. You know, like I, I had no idea how to use coding at all. And I was just spent like hours. Like I remember one day I was like on the computer for like 15 hours, my eyes were burning, trying to learn to code a website. And uh, so it still works, it's still a little sketchy, but uh, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. So Eddie did pretty much cover most of everything. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I've had some much. So I've never really wanted, I never knew what I wanted to be when I was like in high school or anything. So I figured like the same thing, like once I graduate, I'll just kind of let it come to me. Um, but I always looked at like these big companies, right? And I've never looked at like how much money can I make like working for them, for example, or like how happy I would be. I always thought like, how happy would I be like if I started my own big thing? And yeah, that's why when Eddie came to me with the idea, I was like, I was pretty psyched about it. Um, yeah, like he said, like the people that come in from our community, not even just like even the neighboring businesses, they've all came and like shown their support to us, which is like awesome because it's not like we're, it doesn't feel like we're competing with anyone here, you know, like it just feels like we're all like, one big happy Main Street family. But yeah, the people that do come here, like they, I don't, I just treat them as like a friend. Honestly, I don't even, they just come in, we're just talking as if like I've known them for 30 years kind of thing. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, in terms of, yeah, like our business model, it completely pretty much depends on foot traffic. So, and as an entrepreneur, I'd say your most, like your biggest responsibility is, knowing how to problem solve. So we worked like together, we worked on like so many different things, possibilities, like what can we do to overcome this problem? And so far we're, we're still hanging in there pretty strong. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, entrepreneurs. And we're going to turn the evening over to our guests now. So um, if you have a question to ask, you could do it two ways. You can just put your name in the Q&A and Lucy will unmute you or she will turn your camera on if you allow that. Or you could just type your question into the Q&A and we'll pose it for you. And you could direct your question either yourself or through us to one or some or all of our entrepreneurs. And while you're typing, I, I'm actually going to start off with a question and I'm going to ask everybody who wants to answer. Um, if you could time travel and meet your younger self, what advice would you give? It's, it's up and open to whoever wants to take that one. I can go. Um, I would tell myself that you'll always figure it out. Um, I'm... My whole life has been a story of like making plans and then things completely going the opposite way. So just be more comfortable with the uncomfortable because it always leads to something way better that you didn't know was going to happen. Uh, so yeah, just become more comfortable with the uncomfortable and ride out the wave. Anybody else want to pick Hi. that one up? Yeah, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. 
um i would just tell my younger self like don't don't be so um like tunnel vision all the time like you know things fall through and um just keep on going on and just um don't don't be sad if just things don't go your way because that was definitely something that got us down in the beginning and i feel like if we were a little bit more open minded in the beginning things could have escalated a little a little faster and a little better i also want to throw myself <laughs> something okay. um so what i would say to my younger self is be patient um like I, I have I still kind of have this problem where like I'm just never satisfied. I'm always I always want to do more, always want to get more. But you got I want I would tell myself like just be patient, everything's coming and just kind of just chill out. I'll just piggyback on what everyone said, but it's sort of like that journey piece. Like you don't realize the information that you're or the experience that you're getting along the way will help you help lead you somewhere, you know? So, um, you know, so just continue to keep learning and talking to people and trying new things. And you don't realize that all of those pieces will eventually um, help you in some matters. I mean, manner. I mean, I would never have thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I would have always thought of, oh, there's entrepreneurs and then there's these people over here and um, touching on like the tech and the Google, it's really enabled people to um, take their ideas and 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 do them themselves and not having to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on like graphic designers or web developers. Like it really has given you the tools to do a lot of those things on your own. So you never know where you're gonna end up. So just keep learning, keep moving forward and uh, have faith. Do you want to take it away, Antonella? You're muted. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. For me, I found throughout this whole journey, um, I'm a little hard on myself, which I think is good because it kind of pushes me forward. Um, but I remember um, having all these, what I, which I thought were great ideas. And I remember telling people, whether it be family or friends, and they just didn't think it was such a great idea. And I thought, wow, this really sucks. How come they can't see it? And I used to get really frustrated until I realized that this is my dream and this is my goal. And I don't, I shouldn't expect everyone to understand my goal because it's my goal and my dream. And, um, you know, throughout this whole journey, um, we're going to fall. And I used to get frustrated falling. And, you know, now I look back and I think, you know, if I would just have told myself, like, you're going to fall, uh, tomorrow's going to be a new, a new day but you can choose to fall forward or you can choose to fall back. So I figured by falling forward, at least I'm already that step ahead. Um, so I think it's important. Failure is a huge thing. And I'm just, you know, if only I can tell myself that, you know, when I was younger, it would have made the journey, I think, a lot easier. Thank you. Um, Angie has a really good question here that I am really curious as to hear the answer uh, from all of you. And she asks, what has been your best method for advertising? Is the money spent on boosting posts on social media worth it? Who would like to take that one? Oh, I would love to take that one. <laughs> Who's first? Okay. Um, so a lot of people have asked that question, oddly enough. And um, we have only, um, we don't actually pay for advertising. Um, and I'm so adamant about not paying for advertising because, you know, I tell my staff, do your best every single day, treat every single order as though it was your own. And once that person loves it, they will tell somebody else. Um, and if that person hates it, well, guess what? They're telling more people. So for me, I just, you know, the only advice I would say is do whatever you're doing and keep doing your best. Just remember that just like you've got customers, we're also customers. So just treat everybody uh, with the utmost respect, making sure that you're giving them the best quality for their money, go above and beyond. And, you know, even with us, when it comes to cakes, there's some details that maybe cost a little extra, they're more time consuming, but we choose to do them anyway, because that little bit more makes our customers happy. And when customers are happy, they tend to come back. 
uh, when, you know, because everyone's got their hard earned money and they choose to spend it anywhere. And the fact that they're spending it with us is a huge thing. And I feel so blessed. So we just continue to just do what we do and really do it well. And that's the best probably form of advertisement because you've got loyal customers. Who'd like to, to take it? I can go with that too. So I will share a story of horrible mistakes I made in my first full year of business. I wasted, wait for it, $40,000 USD in advertising. I had no idea what I was doing. I was throwing money down a Facebook wasteland. And the truth of the matter is, is exactly what Antonella said. As soon as that happened, I decided to pivot and turn and just focus on making sure my customer was happy because they go and tell someone else. So many people, when I, I, at the end of our website, when you check out, it tells you where you came from. And you can like say, like, I heard from this. So many of our um, checkouts are from, somebody told me, my friend told me, um, I saw my friend repost it. And I make it a point too, when you have an e-commerce business, especially when you get the opportunity to get a pamphlet or some kind of info card into every order, right? Like, hey, if you post this, use this hashtag. And we've created something called the Happy Steeper family, where if you repost it, hashtag Happy Steeper, well, I repost every single story. And it makes everyone feel comfortable and happy at home because they're seeing it. And then you're showing and being shown to their audience and ours. So it's kind of like this give and take you have in your audience, like Antelope is your best form of advertisement. So start there and expand. And in terms of boosting posts specifically on Facebook, because I know sometimes when you post something on Instagram, it'll ask you to boost it because it says it does well. It does not. It's, it's a little bit of a scam. And I've heard that from people who work at Facebook. Um, so I'll just say that. Okay. Tracy? Uh, I, I tend to agree um, with what everybody is saying, but I will talk just a tiny bit just because I am online and I'm service-based. I'm not product-based and everything that everybody said can totally apply still, but it takes on a little bit um, of a different spin when I'm not sort of giving a product, people are enjoying it, it's slightly different. So I would definitely say, yeah, not on the boost. If you are interested in delving a little bit into Facebook ads, that's something I would not ask Google. I would hire a professional who um, creates these ads on a regular basis and knows how to do those. Um, but not thinking social media ads and things is the is the be all end all. Like everybody said, like it's word of mouth. It does take time too. Like just because you build it, people aren't there instantly, right? It really takes the work of building that community and doing an amazing job, like Antonella said, and letting that word of mouth sort of um, sort of circulate because people share that and tell people um, and building that community. I would also say knowing exactly, um, like knowing who your ideal client is, like who you're talking to them, who are you talking to? What do they look like? What are they into? What, what do they do? Where do they consume their stuff? What, where do their friends hang out? Because just throwing something out there and hoping the right person um, latches on, you really need to know a little bit about digging deep on who your people are, who is your tribe. And it's not just everyone has to fit into this little you know, exact same characteristics, but who is your community? What do they have in common? So then you know when you are, you know, like Taylor said, like when you're when you're um when you're creating a hashtag or you're sharing stories, like what do those people want to see? What does their life look like? And and it's creating that connection, right? But if you're asking about boosting posts, like I help people in marketing, I would go email lists any day over boosting posts because that way not only are you taking power away from that darn algorithm um but you're getting your clients emails so that you can reach out to them and build that community and share testimonials and give them discounts and and talk to them and tell stories so those are sort of my two or three little tips thank you felix and eddie would you like to take a stab at this one uh, yeah, so when it comes to advertising, like what me and Eddie have noticed for sure is that word of mouth is huge, um, at least for like for our business. So like we were saying earlier, like our milkshakes, if they're not on Instagram worthy, we're not even serving them or the pierogies. 
Um, so the way it works for us is we have Instagram and we have Facebook. We don't, we haven't really boosted anything yet. Um, I'd say a good time to boost is if you're, once you kind of are more known and then you're pushing one certain like product you're, that you're trying to sell, then it's a really good time to advertise that product. Like people are going to see it more. They're going to see that you're a bit recognized. Um, even for us, so let's say someone posts a picture of their milkshake and then now everyone's posting their pictures of our milkshakes, like just for example, and then we decide to boost it. Now, people who don't know us, they're going to be like, but they see that their friends might follow us on Instagram or Facebook. They're like, oh, okay, like my friends follow, follow these people. So, you know, maybe I'll go check them out. So it's really word of mouth. Um, it's also about being patient. You don't want to like go hard into advertising right away. Just be, you, you want to give yourself a bit of a name first and then proceed to do advertising after. And also to um, touch on that a little bit, one thing that isn't very obvious, but in your community, whether it's Newmarket, Aurora, uh, North York, there is generally, depending on what you're selling or what your service is, there's generally groups that you can join uh, like that. For example, there's a new market group called the New Market Board Gamers. Had I not searched them, I would never have known about them. Uh, and there's also New Market, uh, best restaurants in New Market, but it doesn't have to be just, um, sorry, dinner food or anything. So we, I posted our, I, we were new. I think it was just our like second month in and I posted our, just our lineup of milkshakes and we got like a hundred likes in one day just from the people in the neighborhood. So it depends, like you're, there's, a, there's a group in Newmarket that, uh, that does steaks. It's like steak fanatics of Newmarket and there's like 5,000 people in it, right? So um, it's, it's great. Like I, I didn't even know that was a thing, right? So it, 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 whatever your niche is, I, it's more than likely that there is a group there that has like, you know, the, the, rest, the Newmarket restaurants group, they only allow businesses to post on Mondays and Fridays. But once we posted, I'm like, whoa, like, whoa. <laughs> like this whole influx of people just started liking our pictures, liking our stuff. Like if, if you know you have something that people will like, people will gravitate towards it. Thank you. Um, the next question is from someone who is herself an entrepreneur. Um, she thanks everybody and says, what is the best way to get those first people to build the word of mouth? Um, she is service-based and not product-based. Who would like to take that one? Jim, you're muted. Here we go again, sorry. I'm new to this whole thing. Um, I think the first thing is really believing in what you're selling. I mean, if you don't really like or believe in what you're selling, how are you gonna get other people to like it? So I think being genuine and being real, I think people forget, in my opinion at least, I think there's this whole, stigma around you know selling stuff to people like people are not dumb you know people are consumers and they're hard workers and they have their money and they choose to spend it where they they need to spend it where they choose to spend it and you know people are only gonna like something that you're selling if you truly believe in what you're selling if you don't really like something you're trying to sell sell it to someone i really believe that people can see through that um, and I think part of the whole selling process is not really urging people to buy something. It's just explaining how much you love it yourself. And when you start explaining how much, how amazing this float is, or this tea is milkshake, donut, coffee, whatever it is that you're selling, when you're expressing how much love and passion you have for this, people are like, I want more. Oh my God, I want to try that. And I think that's the first thing in getting people to buy something is really expressing how much you love it because you can stand there with a sign and say try my tea or try my you know what makes you any different than anybody else but when someone hears how much you love it how it enjoyed how you enjoyed it how it put you to sleep that night how it just made you feel so soothed or whatever the benefits were once people start hearing the benefits they're like hey i want to i want to jump onto this i love that milkshake hey, oh, wow, he looks so happy uh, when he's eating or when he's drinking that milkshake. I want to be that happy. So I, don't know, I think it's just about, it all starts with the entrepreneur themselves. Just really believe in what you're selling and um, it will come. People will see that. 
So I, I, I'm going to sort of stick a little piece in here because from this particular entrepreneur, she's service-based. So sometimes when you're service-based, I think you might have the extra, I'm guessing, you might have the extra challenge of you're actually kind of selling yourself. So isn't that maybe a little bit trickier than selling a fabulous product because you're looking for someone to sell what you or your company does? Tracy, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I'm service-based as well, so I totally get that. Um, a few tips and tricks I would say when you're starting out, and hopefully whatever you're offering, um, you do know that there are people that want it. Um, there's, when you're really, really starting out, you could offer some of your smaller pieces for free, like Antonella used to do the cakes, you know, so she knew people loved what she was offering, right? Or when Taylor gave her tea, like the samples, the free samples to the Oprah people and things like that. So, you know, you don't want to do that for too long because we are in this to make money. But, you know, if you want to get people's feedback, you could say, hey, I'd love to give this to you for free. Would you, could you give me a testimonial or could you give me a Google review or things like that? So that's something I've built into my business recently. I just launched a course for the first time and so i'm getting all these great responses and testimonials so i have like created a google doc with my virtual assistant and literally anytime there's sort of a comment from one of our people that say oh my gosh this is so amazing what a great you know what a great resource i've really tried hard to start capturing that all the screenshots so that i can make up a testimonial from that person and then uh, get their approval and share it and share those testimonials it feels a little bit uh, awkward, but share those testimonials on social or in your email list and just sort of, it's like a little bird telling people like, Hey, this person's good at what they do, you know, if, so they remember when they need you. Um, the other thing, whenever I finish with a client at the end of the project, after a couple of weeks, I send them a Google form feedback survey. Um, so it tells like, Hey, what did we work on? How did you feel before you met me? How do you feel now? Um, you know, if you could summarize working with me in one or two sentences, what would that be? And then that's also another great way to get those snippets and feedback um, because again, because it's not product based, it's not quite as like cutesy and fun, but if you can get those and then, you know, make a really great graphic at their picture, or even if you can, I know it's COVID, but like if you get those pictures with them, you know, because a picture says a thousand words. So if you're smiling and laughing and your client looks happy, you're shaking hands or you're doing something, um, that goes, uh, that goes a long way. So those are a few tips on how to sort of build that momentum and tell people that you're awesome. Yeah. Take it away, Phil Felix. Another thing going off Tracy's points too. Yeah. So when you, when you're, yeah, it's probably for product based stuff, it's the product usually speaks for itself in terms of like selling itself and you're kind of just providing the product to the consumer. When it comes to a service, the best thing you can do is just keep pushing it to people and just keep being passionate about it, loving it. Um, if it takes talking to a hundred people and getting one of them to try your service, that's how you get the first word of mouth out. Um, even if it's one in 500 people, that's just what you have to keep doing, keep doing that until it grows, the odds get better and the numbers get better. Um, that's what I would say, like for service-based stuff in terms of like how to get the first word of mouth out. Yeah. And also touch on that, like, uh, what she said as well is like, people have to like you and like people, like if, like if they, they're not buying like somewhat like you might not have like whatever the best coffee but if they like you they're gonna come back or mm -hmm. wh whatever service people want to work with you not necessarily because even if you start you may not be doing things better than as somebody else say that's doing something similar but they'll choose you over them because you give a better experience and they like you as a person because not only do you believe in yourself but you believe in what you're doing and i feel like a lot of people come here you know there's you can throw a rock and hit 10 different places that sell board games right but they uh they come here because they like that they feel invited that their guests here will will play the games with them will explain the games you know if, if we have some downtime like that's why people choose to come and see us actually i want to um maybe take the two a little bit the product and the service and i want to throw this at taylor if i might because it strikes me that what you're doing in a way with tea is a product but it's also the whole ambiance and service of the experience of drinking tea 
strikes mm -hmm. me that your entrepreneurial journey has actually kind of brought the two together. Would you would you say that? For sure. I, I think, you know, when you have a product, especially if it's a product that isn't necessarily proprietary, the importance, my, oh, my apologies, my, the importance about creating an, an experience with that product becomes more important because it's not something where you can just go to the next person, but it's like you said, it's how it makes you feel. And so I, whenever I'm talking and I had the opportunity to do press opportunities, really explain the why I'm so passionate about it. It's because of the fact that I used, I still love sitting at my table in my island with my mom and our friends and having that cup of tea and feeling that sense of home. That is so important to that feeling. And especially when I hit, when COVID hit, I really leaned into that, not because it wasn't true, but because there was nothing in more of a time more when people wanted to feel at home, feel that sense of comfort. So when you are able to craft a brand and products that have are high quality, but also make people feel something, if you, it's not the personal person behind the service, it's the product that has to do all of the talking for that feeling, it's so important and it goes a really long way. Um, and I think it's been one of the really big key factors for our success. Thank you. And Tracy, you wanted to add something as well. If you could speak to, uh, you had another idea coming up on podcasts. Oh, sorry. I, yeah, I, I um, replied in a comment. Podcasts and partnerships for service-based is, I mean, for everybody probably, but what I found is, um, you know, finding people with, that aren't your direct competitors, but are, have similar ideal clients. You know, I've been on a few different podcasts, spoken at events like this, um, and I have a blog as an example. So I have other partners and people, like I might be calling some of all you afterwards saying, hey, do you wanna come on? I'll do an article about you. And then so, you know, Eddie and Felix would reach my audience who might be local and love Market Main Street, which is amazing. And next time they go to Maid's Cottage, they're going to hop over to Goblets and Goblins and get a milkshake or something like that. So trying to think of, the, and again, it all comes back to building that community, but podcasts, blogs, partnerships, things like that, um, those are also great ways to reach new audiences and sort of get your message out there. So um, while we're waiting to see uh, what our audience might want to, to ask, I'm going to throw out another question. Um, you must have all started, and you sort of touched on it a little bit with some assumptions, um, which of course got tossed in the tornado of COVID. But, but that aside, did you actually start off with a plan and an agenda and thinking you were going to test it in a certain way and build in evaluations? Did, all of, did you put all of that into your business plan before everything became chaos, when you thought it was just going to be a normal start off of business? open it up to whoever wants to speak? Um, definitely not. I didn't have a, you know, when they tell you to make a business plan, like make they a, tell you that in school, right? Yeah, with the college yeah. paper. I, I, I remember downloading one, a template of Google and I looked at it and I was like, yeah, this isn't for me. And it, it, it helps keep other people organized. But for me, I just like to keep it really simple. I knew I wanted to sell tea. I knew that I wanted to market it in a luxury format. And I knew that it was gonna be a lot of work and I wanted to be online. And I took those as the main things and ran with it. Now that doesn't work for everybody, but I think especially if you are someone who becomes very easily overwhelmed, um, you know, finding the way that it works for you and not necessarily feeling pressured always to do it the most traditional way is important. Now, if you're needing, you know, to go to a bank for significant loans and they require those things, obviously you have to do that, but just make sure you know that it doesn't have to be more complicated than you need to. And it's not gonna be perfect, no matter how many years or months you spend doing it, day one you launch is not gonna be perfect. So sometimes I think it was Tracy who said, can have like 83% of an idea. And that's a really good starting point to just jump off because it's never going 
to be perfect. So I am two and a half years into it. We've had major success. It's still day to day. I run into issues um, and just know that it's going to be okay to, you know, make stumbles along the way. Would somebody else like to, to speak to that? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, like, like I said before, like we had a concrete, like bulletproof business plan. I had, I've been working on it for a long time. And like, cause like we, we run a very unique business and, and, and the fact that it's, um, it's a hybrid retail slash restaurant. So like the whole front half of our store is all retail, uh, board games and card games and whatever you want to pick up. And then you have our whole back area where it's, um, you sit down and play. We also have a small kitchen and like a bar and like, so in order to have all those pieces moving together, like it, it was hard to, cause like I'm, I'm also actually a pretty simple guy. I don't like to, you know, put too many pieces together, but we had to make sure everything was going to run smoothly because I didn't want some of us at the bar and then the and then like the retail side is not getting looked at and like people are browsing, but no one's there to help them. But then we also need like a wait staff back here taking orders, you know, so it's, um, it's challenging. Um, but I mean, like with co and, and then COVID happened and then, uh, so we were basically square one started uh, basically let's start a new business now. Kind of a uh, kind of idea. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'd, I'd also say <laughs> that, um, when you do write like a business plan, like I'd say even 90% of the time, what what's written on there is there, like you're gonna wanna do that, but there's always more that you're gonna wanna add and more that you wanna explore. You're gonna have like all these ideas, like just flowing through your brain constantly and you're gonna be getting creative. So like not everything is written on the business plan itself. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, your business plan is still stored up here as well. And Janelle, I think you are gonna add something to, to this. Yeah, I do remember, I know Taylor mentioned a business plan, and I remember so many people um, saying, you have to write a business plan. And I thought, oh gosh, I spent so much time trying to think of where I can access a business plan and trying to learn what a business plan was until I went, you know what, I'm just going to do what I feel I want to do, and I'm going to just do it to the best of my ability I think that was my business plan because I felt like I was spending weeks just trying to write stuff out. I'm like, well, who am I going to give this to? And then what are they going to need after this? And I felt it was for me, at least um, my business was so unique compared to everybody else. And um, I think when I realized that I wasn't going to follow what everyone else did, um, it kind of worked for me. And it was mainly just doing what I felt worked at that time and also being really open to change like just when you're walking forward and a door opens go through that door you may not know what to expect but just keep plugging away keep going forward the new opportunity comes and make a decision based on when that new opportunity comes because a lot of us always want our life so regimented we always go okay well today we're going to wake up and we're going to go here here and here and at 10 o'clock we're going to do this and when something doesn't work quite the way you wanted it to, then there's this whole thing of disappointment and disappointment comes in and then all of a sudden your day is a disaster. So I went, you know, I'm just going to play it by ear. I'm one step forward, one step forward and just really do what I felt was right for my brand. Because I also had to realize you really can't be everything to everyone. And once I found my niche, um, that's when I realized this is what I have to do because you can't do something and make everybody happy. It's almost impossible. I've got two kids. I can't make one decision that works for both of them. So what makes me think that I'm going to have one particular flavor of cake or donut that's going to work for everyone. So I think the minute I found, I realized that I had a niche product, I would move in that direction and just keep following that and whatever felt uh, most comfortable and right at the time. So I'm going to remind our, our, um, viewers to just feel free to type your question into the Q&A and we'll post them to our, our panelists. But I have one for you because you've been talking about branding. And uh, when I look at your um, the titles of your business, your name of your business, your brand ident, Artsy Baker, that is cool. Kitchen Table CEO, Goblets and Goblins and Cup of Tea. Like those are fabulous, fabulous branding names and they're so very unique. And branding is so important to a successful company. Um, 
but it's also really expensive. So I'm wondering if you would share how you developed your brand identity, like these great names, your logos, your websites. How did you put it all together? Did you go out and get a marketer to do it for you? Do, do you have a lot of friends? Are you really good at this yourself? Because that's a, that's a whole other business and a huge important one to success. Tracy, I think you were going to say something. I love your website. Uh, thanks. Um, so a few things on this which is which is kind of fun um i listened to a podcast recently by jenna kutcher she has the gold digger podcast which is amazing if you're an entrepreneur or small business it's an amazing podcast with so many nuggets and she said you know and not to negate branding it's all you gotta have it and it's important but she said sometimes people and this ties into the business plan question too sometimes people start with their branding right and they're like i've got to get that logo perfect i've got to get the name perfect and they haven't kind of come up with a business plan or an offer. And so she was saying that I think the, the podcast was called the five things you don't need when you start a business. And the premise was the most important thing is that you have created an offer, whether it's a product or service that people want, you know, so it's like killer milkshakes. Is it awesome teas at beautiful cakes? Like clearly everybody um, on this panel has nailed that. They've created something that people want. And then, you know, the branding is going to flow from that and help. Right? But you do need that thing that people want because that's business. For me, um, I actually literally took a giant piece of Bristol board out and wrote down like all of the adjectives, people having like, words that describe women, words for home, blah, blah, blah. And like tried to sort of match the adjectives and words together. And that's how I sort of came up with Kitchen Table CEO because it was talking about people building a business and people working from home. And oftentimes we're sitting at our kitchen tables. So that's how I sort of came up with it um, myself. But a tool I recommend to all small businesses and entrepreneurs is Canva. If you haven't checked that out, you can do any, any kind of graphic you need for your business. So you have any inkling of creativity in your body. There's like templates and templates and templates of logos in there. So you know what? Do not go sp spend $7,000 on a logo at the beginning. You can treat yourself later, but I think it's something that um, that does evolve and you don't need to spend um, the huge bucks on it. That's just my personal opinion at the beginning stages. Anybody else want to call in on this one? Sure, I can. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, well, when I started my business, it was quite a few years ago. It was 15, 16 years ago. And um, we didn't have access to the internet like we do now. And I think there's something to be said about being able to just kind of go on this computer or phone and all of a sudden have access to almost like Google, right? <laughs> you said, just go on to Google. There's so many apps. There's so many programs that you can actually go. Um, you can actually download that are so user-friendly. Years ago, you had to spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars to create a website. And I mean, uh, you still you know, you still do depending on what type of website you're looking for, of course. But, you know, for someone who's just starting out, you know, I think small steps, just kind of, like you said, Canva is one really good one. You know, going to Wix, uh, GoDaddy, um, all these hosting websites that you can actually use. Um, they have like free website services, like a drag and drop sort of thing. So you really don't have to be too tech savvy. Um, you can start off like that. And then, you know, later on, if you realize that you need something a little bit more, you keep adding on. So I think the internet is a great, uh, great tool. Anybody else have a, Taylor? Yeah, so um, mine is a little bit different from the other two, but I decided uh, because I knew that I was, we are considered a luxury loose leaf tea company. So I, the importance of some of those things was, extremely you know important straight from the beginning so I I think I spent five hundred dollars and I did something on something called oh my gosh what is it called it wasn't but it was called design crowd and on design crowd what they do is they have a bunch of freelance artists and I put in the brief of what I wanted for a logo and what they do is they all submit their interpretations of your brief and the really cool thing about that is that for the $500, I'm getting 50 to 60 different samples of logos based on what my idea was. And I was very detailed on like the things I wanted to feel and how I wanted it to evoke a feeling. I also knew that with our brand, if I don't have my logo here, but when you look at our logo, 
the more I loved logos when, when you, you look at it, the more you see. So if you look at our logo, the U is actually in the shape of a cup and the P is actually the handle for the cup. And I just took what I love again from brand experiences and applied it to my own. And I got about 50 different logos to look at and really honed in on one and went offline actually with that designer. And we spent another two, three months really perfecting it, going back and forth in a collaborative effort. So that was the way we did it. But in my daily life, I use Canva every single day. I think it's absolutely amazing. And um, like everyone said, it has everything you could ever need on there. And so just really knowing what brand positioning you want to have and what is important from the jump to get your business going. I knew I couldn't start my business and necessarily redesign my logo later. So I had to do that really, I think I spent in total five months working on it. Um, and I will say, if you do have a product, make sure that no one else has the product name before you get invested in your logo, because I created a whole logo called T by Tay. And then when I went to go register it, realize that it's already taken and that was heartbreaking so make sure you do your research first before you fall in love with a name and a logo and have to deal with that later because you don't want any legal issues it's a good story um would anybody else like to respond to that one yeah um so we wanted something that would um really brand us um we love our name we love that you can just say g and g you know, like we, we're going to G&G &G tonight to play games or something like that. Um, our, we have a little goblin logo. And I feel like I, the reason we made that as our little mascot is that we don't even want to, eventually once our name gets more and more out there, all of, we do have uniforms here and we will start branding our cups. We don't even want to put our name on anything anymore. We just want the little goblin on there because we want it to be so recognizable, right? It's just like, you know, like it just like I'm not gonna start comparing us to McDonald's, but like McDonald's just puts their M on things, right? And you already know, you already associate with that. And it's also a very simple logo. Um, we were fortunate that our our friends are in design, our close family friends, so they just whipped it up in like an hour. It didn't take them too long because we didn't need anything intricate. Um, but yeah, we just in our eyes, we just wanted something recognizable that still ties into the business. You know, goblins are kind of nerdy. Um, you, you can have goblets at our store as in like beer and stuff. So just kind of tied them all together. I like what he just said there in the sense, I mean, if you're going to make your own logo, you can still do research to find out how to make a good logo, right? Um, and you touched on it there and that usually you have like your business name, but then you also have some sort of image or uh, I forgot the the technical terminology for it. But again, so it can stand on its own, right? You want to be able to have a horizontal version, more of like a circular or vertical version, and then the image that can appear with or without the text. So those are three good pieces because sometimes you're going to want a logo in a circle, sometimes you're going to want it more length, and then sometimes you want to be so popular that you can only use the image like the like G&G guys. So, um, but definitely don't let it hold you up though. If, and then I think there was a follow-up question about whether it tweaks and changes over time. And I don't think if you're gonna have a successful business that it's reasonable to think that it won't change over time. And that's, that's okay, I think. And again, get to that 85% and just go for it. Don't let a little go hold you. There was a, another question came in um, and Taylor, this was I, mostly to you. Who do you use for uh, shipping and do you tailor the size of your products based on shipping costs per item? And now that so many people are ordering online, that's actually a, a really important question. I love this question because it's a question I wish I had asked before creating so many of our products. Um, I use, so for shipping, I use Shopify as my platform. If you are an e-commerce business, I would recommend it day in and day out. Like it's, I cannot think of a better platform in terms of just like fees, um, capabilities to edit, all of those things, drag and drop, templates, all of it. So simple. With Shopify, you get calculated discount shipping rates with Canada Post. Now we all know Canada Post isn't the greatest. 
However, within Canada, it's really our not, we don't have very many options. So if you have, have to ship products, you get calculated discounted shipping rates on any plan that you have with Shopify. So I use Canada Post. Now, if you are starting a business or thinking of starting a business, one thing you want to take into consideration is how big is your product going to be? If I were to start another business, it would be something small, similarly to like jewelry or something, anything you can fit in the mail slot, you can ship for $5 and under. Anything you can't fit becomes weight-based and the shipping fees are so fun. So when you create your product, take that into account. And if you are going to be a heavier product or a wider product like we are, make sure your pricing reflects that. One thing I had to work out very quickly in my business was what is our pricing structure going to be where it makes sense for me, where it doesn't scare our customers and what pricing structure, like what at $50 or $75 makes sense to offer free shipping. You don't want to deter your customers, but also know that there will always be a customer and it might take a little while longer for them to find you because I did have to skew my price up a dollar or two more than I wanted to in our first month. However, we found our customers and we found our niche in our lane and it's worked out that way. Um, but also just really make sure you take into account that shipping is expensive and doesn't seem to be changing. And I, they'll never go down. If anything, it'll only go up from here. Um, so to make sure your pricing takes that into account. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very, very important for e-commerce business. Has anybody else had any experience with that? Or Antonella, you're not shipping your uh, products out, are you? You are? Yeah, we are actually. Oddly enough, I mean, not we've uh, we've been asked uh, a number of times to ship cakes um, to different countries. We haven't done that just because it just seems overwhelming just to think about it. Uh, but we have gone across border um, with larger cakes. Um, it's almost impossible to do um, the freshness of the product. Um, you know, is our main concern. But uh, donuts, we've actually uh, shipped. Um, across Canada. Um, those are a little bit more stable and can stay a little bit longer. Uh, but for our regular products, like our custom cakes, uh, I'm a little picky. Um, you know, if people are spending um, money on a custom cake, they want someone to handle it properly. So making the cake is really difficult, but believe it or not, shipping it is even more uh, difficult. Uh, because it has to stay intact on route. So we've actually, I used to actually do the deliveries myself, had my husband help. Um, we've had our staff and now we have a full-time driver, uh, but that's just because our line of business requires that with wedding cakes and such. So, but um, we've actually used Uber, um, oddly enough, uh, quite a few times. Um, and they would, you know, when we were stuck in a rut and we couldn't leave, we would just call Uber and have Uber send it out. Probably not the most feasible option, but kind of gets you through the rut at that particular time. If you want a really good courier within the city, um, use Mad Dash Transport. And Tanella, they are cheaper than Uber and they strictly handle like packages and all those things, that's like what they do. And they really have a great tracking system back and forth. Um, yeah, because I've done the Uber thing too before in a crunch, oh, yeah. but that dash is cheaper and more consistent, reliable, and you can do same day, like everything. It's great. We've had one company that we use, and I, I don't want to say their name, um, but I just, I wasn't happy with them. They were a fairly popular, reputable company and it, you know, maybe it worked for other people uh, with packages, but with us and food, things that are decorated um, a certain way, um, you know, our product wasn't getting to the customer in the right way. I mean, sometimes we'd get photos going, oh my God, does that, that doesn't even look like a cupcake. Um, so yeah, we had to be very picky with who we use, uh, but I'm definitely going to, what's called Mad Dash. I'm definitely going to get Mad involved. Dash transport. Look, look into them. I, I, I know you have specific uh, requirements with the delicacy of your foods, but I would, I'd look into them. Thank you. Welcome. I think uh, Eddie and Felix, you were going to add something. Yeah, so um, in, ter it, it, in terms of shipping stuff, like uh, we, we, like I said, we never even intended on having an e-commerce, but uh, we, we also use Shopify as well. And they are, they're, oh uh, yeah, so good. But wow. um, some of our board games, they are hella heavy. They are huge. 
like Fireball Island, that thing to ship that thing is like 25 bucks. <laughs> um, but we do, we do make customers um, pay for shipping. It is what it is. But if, like I said, if they really want something, I mean, they're going to get it right. So it's just, you shouldn't shy away from that at all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have to, I actually, I'll share with you that uh, right at, I'm not generally an online shopper, um, but of course, in the, our current uh, environment, I, I did do a, an online purchase right towards the beginning. I think it was probably the first online purchase I met and uh, I made, and maybe about 15 minutes after I put it on my visa, my bell rang and I wasn't expecting anybody. And it was the owner of the store. And she said, I thought I would just get this to you right away because I was really <laughs> excited. And I, you know what? I recommended her to everybody because I thought that was such a nice personal touch. Well, of course, it's not that far away, but I just thought that was such a nice personal touch that she was excited about my purchase and she just delivered it to me on her way home. So anyway, it's those extra little service things that stay with the customer, everybody. I'm a customer and I got to tell you, I remember those. I do think one last, oh, sorry, if you don't mind. No, go, yes, please. Any company, anybody that start, anyone that's starting out, um, you know, and, you know, is wondering if they should ship, I would really highly recommend it. It's, it's kind of intimidating at first. There's so much to learn, but I feel, um, especially during this whole COVID period that we're all going through, I think it's, I think it's vital. Um, I don't think you can stand, not that you can't stand, I just think your, your options um, you won't get as much business if you can't ship. I think right now people are shopping from the comfort of their own home. Uh, a lot of people that have never been accustomed to that or doing any sort of thing online are now doing that. And whether they want to or they're forced to do it, this is the way of the world. So if you have a product, it's really important to get shipping, um, to get things out to your customer because not everyone is going to drive over to see you. That's a good point. And, uh, Tracy? A little bit because um, <clears throat> that's one of the things I help my clients with is um, creating websites and writing content for them and coordinating that whole piece when they're starting out. And we were working with um, a local clothing shop. Um, and it, it's just interesting because for people who had their businesses prior to COVID, you know, and you talk about business plans and things, they have a certain way or idea that they have run their business, right? And then COVID has thrown it all to the wayside and all of a sudden you're closed and you have no way of getting your products out, right? So we worked with a lot of people to develop websites for their small business so that they could open up that new audience. And, you know, sometimes I hear people say, well, that's not how my, my customers or clients consume my goods because they are a local store and they have those relationships with their community their community or their customers and coming in and talking to them, but it's not to replace that. And I think what people need to know that love that sort of community small business feel is that the website's not meant to replace that, but it's meant to extend your reach, right? So your customers might, well, not this year, but you know, they might go away for part of the winter or, you know, maybe they want to order something from you and support you further, but it's for a friend that doesn't live in your town, right? So you can, the tool to your current customers to support you in an even bigger way, but you can also reach clients and customers that you never have been able to reach in the past. So you're not giving up that small business personal touch feel, you're just adding to it and then creating those other sort of streams or audiences. So we have another question that's come in from our attendees. Any comments from the panel on the Etsy platform? Yeah, I'm on Etsy as well. Um, you know, I think it depends on your product. <laughs> I think it depends on your product. Um, if you have something, Etsy does really well for handmade things. And I think if you have a handmade product, uh, that is where you will thrive. Some people even love it more than Shopify just because of Etsy has branded itself so much as a unique one of a kind handmade um, arena. Their fees are higher than Shopify. Their shipping, I don't think you get as good shipping rates as you do with Shopify. However, if you're in the handmade crafted um, sector, that is the place to go because their curation of content and searchability is so great on there as opposed to someone coming to your standalone website for yourself. 
like for me, you have to come to www.cupoftea.com, Etsy, someone could type in handmade bracelet and you'll be one of a few. So yes, you're competing with other people. However, they'll find you if, it, if that makes sense. So there's pros and cons. And I will say that I'm going to have to hop off in about two minutes, but if I don't get a chance to, thank you everyone so much for the time. This was really, really great. They can find thank us. Thank you, which we'll take Tracy and then we're gonna end off. So Tracy, did you have a comment on Etsy? I don't have a ton of experience on Etsy, but a couple of my clients are on Etsy that I work with. And the only thing that I wanted to say is whenever you are um, using, like just, when you're looking at websites or social media or things that you're using to help promote your business, just try and retain as much control as you can over your client list. So I had heard, and I don't know if this is true, but like with the Etsy, you are collecting emails or with Amazon, I heard from somebody else, are they are collecting emails, but you're not allowed to use the emails for your own purposes. So it's almost like you're gaining the search, the search function and that exposure through these places, which is amazing, but then, <clears throat> trade-off is potentially you're not owning that client relationship as much sometimes. I know Etsy, you can talk to the owner and things like that. So that's okay. But I would just, I really, I'm, I, I push that, you know, don't rely on Mark Zuckerberg or Etsy or anybody to sort of build those client relationships for you. Try and get the emails of your clients and get to know them so that you can interact with them directly and follow up and keep in touch and build that sort of long-term relationship instead of just the one-offs and then you don't control that. So that was just like a little tidbit depending on what platform you're and their features. Thank you. So I'm going to close the evening off now. Um, and I really want to thank Tracy Smith, Taylor Lindsay Noel, Antonella Cellini and Eddie and Felix Rail for so generously sharing their time and their expertise. And I want to thank all of our viewers for spending your evening with us. Um, our next Entrepreneurs in Residence will happen in November. If you are an entrepreneur who wants to present or you know someone with a good story, everybody knows where they can find me in the library. Let me know because we'll be looking for new presenters. And uh, I really want to thank everyone for spending your evening with us and for being part of such an engaging conversation. Good night, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you.